Good afternoon. I'm Louis Archibald, Professor of Reproduction here at the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Florida. And it certainly is my pleasure to be able to present this lecture to you today. Just by way of introduction, I should tell you that I'm a graduate of the University of Guelph, uh, Guelph, Ontario, where I got my DVM degree, and I did my PhD in postgraduate work at the University of Minnesota. Then I traveled a little bit back to Tennessee, to Baton Rouge, and then to Florida, where I've been for the last 18 years. I've been in the business of teaching research in the area of reproduction for about 30 years. Today's lecture will deal with some of the basic and clinical aspects of reproduction in the dog, in the cat, and also in the, in the horse. Obviously, due to time constraints, only certain aspects will be considered. However, what I have done, I'll give you four textbooks, four reference textbooks, which will provide additional information and hopefully clarify some of the problems that you may have in terms of this particular, uh, this particular lecture. And these references, in small animals, it's canine and feline theory genealogy, <coughs> which is probably the most recent book in this area, published by Johnson, who are the editors, canine and feline endocrinology and reproduction, which is sort of a standard text, not only in reproduction, but for certain aspects of endocrinology. And it is, it is a pretty good book. From the standpoint of the horse, Current Therapy in Large Animal Theory and Genealogy, a book published by Young Chris in 1997, that is pretty good, and a little more specific, dealing primarily with the equine, in equine reproduction, by McKenna and Voss, which was published in 1993. Let's begin with looking at small animal reproduction, uh, primarily in the bitch and the queen, and the two aspects that we're going to consider are the estrous cycle, and pregnancy diagnosis. In the bench, we consider the estrous cycle as non-seasonal. There's one exception to this, which is the vicinity breed, which seems to have a cycle or period of, of, of activity primarily in the fall. But by and large, most of the other breeds tend to be not seasonal, simply meaning that there are dogs that come in the heat throughout each month of each year. We see that the dog is monestrous, and what that simply means is there is one period of receptivity, or estrus, within the reproductive cycle. So we can say that the estrus cycle of the bitch can just be characterized as being non-seasonal, monestrous, except again, noting the vicinity breed tends to be primarily in the fall. There are four phases to the estrus cycle. Anestrous, proestrous, estrous, and diestrous. Now let's look at each one of these uh, individually. And let's look at anestrous. It can range from four to ten months. And it's really the period of uterine involution. We see that in the dog, the uterus of the dog is exposed to very high levels of estrogen and progesterone throughout the estrous cycle. And a lot of changes that occur are very proliferative to the point where the bitch is actually expecting a pregnancy. So it takes a lot of time for this uterus to sort of involute to get back to its non-pregnant state, so to speak, so she can, in fact, get pregnant on the next, next cycle. So this is why it stretches for four to ten months. And in fact, it's been shown that any anestrous period that's less than four months in length usually predisposes to infertility simply because of the very hostile environment that that embryo encounters and, and pregnancy is not maintained. The period of anestrous begins the end of diestrous to the very first day of the next proestrous. Hormonally, progesterone levels are pretty low, LH levels are pretty low, FSH concentrations are higher but pretty variable and if one were to do vaginal cytology, you would see primarily paravasal cells and lots of neutrophils or PMNs and obviously lots of bacteria. In terms of proestrus, uh, it averages about nine days. And again, there's a lot of variation in there. Um, 
but on the average, it's about nine days. And it's the phase of estrogen dominance. An interesting thing in the dog is that estrogen actually peaks 24 to 48 hours before the end of proestrus. So in reality, it precedes estrus. And this is unique for the dog because, like you know, in most species, estrogen concentrations are high at the time that the animal is actually in heat. In terms of progesterone, progesterone concentrations are very low until the very end of proestrus. And clinically, one can see the hemorrhagic bloody discharge, which is actually coming from bleeding from the uterus as a result of estrogen effect on the uterus, enlargement and edematous um, aspects of the vulva, and this is the period of time in which the female actually attracts the male but does not allow mating. Throughout all but the end of proestrus, progesterone concentrations are very low. And we said before, Estrogen actually peaks prior to the end of proestrus. However, at the beginning of estrus, which is the next phase, you have a very gradual rise in progesterone. And this is important because it can be used clinically to determine the day of the LH surge, which is another important day in the estrus cycle of the bitch. You need to remember that this progesterone is actually coming from pre-obligatory glutinization of ovarian follicles. In other words, it's happening prior to ovulation, and this is important to remember. In terms of vaginal psychology, uh, it can be used to sort of describe various areas of proestrus uh, in the bitch. If we think in terms of the early phase, we see a lot of red blood cells. We said before that the bleeding is actually coming from the uterus. We see few parabasal cells, uh, cells that we call intermediate cells, uh, a few polymorphic nucleus uh, neutrophils, and there may or may not be the presence of bacteria. As you get into mid proestrus, you can still see red blood cells, but you see more intermediate cells. Bacteria may or may not be present, and you see uh, a few what we call superficial cells. The interesting thing is, as pro proestrus progresses, there should not be any PMNs, and this simply means that the PMNs that are actually coming uh, from intravascular into the anterior vagina cannot migrate to the many layers of, uh, of cells that, we, that line the uh, anterior vagina. <coughs> Very late in proestrus, you can see few intermediate cells, but the predominant cell type is what we call uh, nucleated or enucleated superficial cells, uh, enucleated screens. And again, an interesting component and a very important clinical one is the fact that there are no PMNs. Interestingly enough, there can also be uh, a hemorrhagic discharge. Uh, traditionally, we tend to say that the discharge changes as the bitch comes in the heat, but normally, uh, in, all, in all bitches, this doesn't always happen. So it really presents a problem, especially in terms of the traditional way of looking uh, at the time to breed the bitch, simply saying, when the hemorrhagic discharge goes away or changes to more clear, uh, straw-colored, it's much more likely that the time of breeding uh, is imminent. This, is, this doesn't happen in all dogs and can usually be a very, very important cause of infertility uh, in the bitch. Estrus can vary uh, on the average. It lasts about nine days. The hormonal pattern of, in doing estrus is decreasing estradiol concentrations, which become the basal levels of doing estrus, and increasing progesterone concentrations. Again, this is unique in the bitch because many animals, when they are in heat or receptive in estrus, have high levels of estrogen and low levels of progesterone. The bitch is a little different in that she has high levels of progesterone and low levels of estrogen. An important point in the entire estrus period is the day of the LH surge. And we know LH or luteinizing hormone is necessary for ovulation in the bitch. This is the time when the bitch actually allows mating, although one cannot be always consistent with this sign, simply because behavioral problems are in the bitch with respect to uh, a dominant female or a dominant male may not always allow the act of mating, even though the bitch is an estrus. You can have a, a vulva discharge, swelling of the vulva, and again, a hemorrhagic discharge could be, could be present. Psychology, we see 
that greater than 90% of superficial cells throughout estrus. So in reality, it's difficult to stage estrus using vaginal cytology because the cells look alike for the entire period of estrus. An important thing to remember is that there are no neutrophils or no PMNs. If one should see neutrophils with a smell that shows primarily superficial cells, then one has to think of an infection somewhere else, probably uh, kidney, uh, urinary bladder, uh, vaginitis, and so forth. There may be a lot of bacteria uh, in the smear simply because there are no PMNs to take care of all these bacteria. So in asterisk, uh you see primarily uh, superficial cells. Diastrus uh, lasts about 60 days, and it's really the period of progesterone dominance after estrus. Its maximal uh, progesterone concentrations are 20 to 30 days after ovulation. And levels of progesterone are pretty high in the bitch. In fact, we think of 15 to 60 nanograms per mil. This is pretty high. If you look at, uh, for instance, in, in the horse, levels of diastrus, progesterone during diastrus usually range about 10 to 12 nanograms per mil. And in the cow, it's similar. So the dog has very high levels of progesterone, and this speaks to the point again where it needs that period of, of anestrus of at least four months for the uterus to recover from high levels of estrogen and progesterone. An interesting thing in the bitch is that the corporal lutea for the form following ovulation in the non-pregnant bitch is, lasts a lot longer than in the pregnant bitch. We know that pregnancy averages roughly 63, 65 days. So the lifespan of the corporal lutea in a pregnant bitch is about 63 to 65 days. In a non-pregnant bitch, you can have corporal lutea functional as late as 80 or 90 days uh, post LH surgery. A very important day uh, in diastrus is what we call the first day of cytologic diastrus. And what this simply means is, we mentioned before, that during estrus, the predominant cell type is superficial cell. So throughout estrus, if you're following this bitch with vaginal smears, you suddenly see a change from superficial cells to some more intermediate cells to even some parabasal cells. And sometimes you may have a few neutrophils or a few PMNs sort of infiltrating uh, the slide. So this day is called the first day of cytologic diastrus. And it's a rapid change. And you have to be following the bitch uh, sequentially. And the change actually occurs within 24 to 48 hours after the end of estrus. There may or may not be red blood cells. So the point I'm trying to make with the red blood cell is it's pretty variable. And one cannot rely on the presence of the red blood cell to stage the cycle. In fact, the first day of cytologic diastrus, if one were to see red blood cells, could be pretty confusing because one also has to consider is it the beginning of proestrus as we talked about previously. An important point from the standpoint of the first day of cytologic diastrus is that parturition would occur 56 to 58 days from the day, first day of cytologic diastrus. And this is important if one are look, is looking to do a selective uh, C-section, especially in dogs that are predisposed to, to dystocia, some of the brachycephalic dogs and so forth. So it does give you a pretty good handle on when you should look for, for parturition to begin, especially if you're planning a, a caesarean section. This slide sort of summarizes it all in the sense, if you can look, estrogen is rising, it sort of peaks, just before the end of proestrus, and then drops off pretty much, pretty dramatic, dramatically, to almost basal levels. Day zero indicates the first day of estrus. If you look back here, we see progesterone levels are pretty low until just about prior to the beginning of, of estrus, it begins to rise. And this area back in here is pretty important because if you were to measure levels of progesterone, and we can pick up this rise in progesterone, we can actually see or predict the day of the LH surge. And that's important because although there's a lot of variability in terms of hormone levels and so forth, and length of estrus and diastrus, the one consistent thing that we do see in the bitch is the day of the LH surge. So the day of the LH surge becomes important because one can then predict maximal fertility with respect to the old type. Keeping in mind that when the LH surge occurs, ovulation is going to occur within 24 to 96 hours. Remember, there are many, many follicles that ovulate. So it takes time. 
and as much as 96 hours, full ovulation may be completed. Another thing that occurs is that the bitch ovulates a primary oocyte, simply meaning that it's immature. So it has to go through the second meiotic division to make it a secondary oocyte, which then makes it eligible to be, to be fertilized. So this gives you, this process takes another 48 hours. So what it does, it gives you a time frame of four to six days, actually, from the day of the LH surge, when you can predict the day or the window for maximum fertility. So if we look at the day of the LH surge, we can say, uh, we can breed this bitch, if everything goes all right, allowing maximum fertility within four to six days post the day of the LH surge. And this becomes important, especially if you're shipping the bitch out to be bred, or even more importantly, if you're using frozen semen, because like we know, frozen semen can, is most effective if used or deposited directly into the uterus, which simply means surgery. So you don't want to put the bitch under surgery too many times, and this gives you a, a sort of a, a technique to predict the best time to inseminate this bitch. So let's assume you'll be successful, we get this bitch pregnant. How are we going to diagnose pregnancy? A couple of ways that one can do it, the first is abdominal palpation. And this is pretty specific in terms of when it can be done. The optimum time is days 26 to 30. So this simply means that if you have the day of the LH surge, you're much better able to predict the best time to do it. However, many times we don't. And we usually get the very last day or the very one time that the dog has been bred. So 26 to 30 days uh, is the best time but keep in mind that if you're not specific with respect to the day of the LH surge, that your diagnosis could be incorrect. Between this time frame, uh, the conceptuses are pretty spherical, 15 to 30 millimeters in diameter. And as they begin to get older, day 35, they begin to elongate, they become less palpable. When you get after day 55, uh, in many dogs, you can actually see those fetuses moving, whilst you can feel them uh, palpating uh, outside the abdomen. So abdominal palpation is one way that one can do it. However, it does have its, its limitations. Ultrasonography uh, is another way, probably a little more precise way. But again, it certainly helps if you have the day of the LH surge. Because if you have the day of the LH surge, you can see the conceptuses as early as 15 days post-ovulation. So it gives you a little shorter window where you can actually diagnose pregnancy at an earlier age. In addition, you can look for the fetal heartbeat at approximately 22, 23 days uh, of pregnancy. However, many times you don't have this information, so we tell the clients the very last day, take a month from the very last day that the dog's been bred, the dog comes in, you have ample time, ample opportunity, I should say, to diagnose pregnancy using ultrasound. One of the interesting things about ultrasound is, although you can tell viability of the fetuses, it's difficult to give an accurate count. So if you were to use ultrasonography, you can simply say the ones that we see are viable. Keeping in mind that sometimes you may be looking at the same fetus or two different cuts using ultrasonography. So don't attempt to predict the number of fetuses that you have in there uh, using ultrasonography. And it does tell you the ones that you can see are pretty viable. Radiography for the use of x-ray is Another way that one can do it, it's actually pretty effective. But you have to wait until after day 45. And the reason for this is that you need mineralization of all the bones so they can actually show up on x-ray. An x-ray or radiography is really a pretty good tool because it allows you to give, to obtain an accurate count of the number of fetuses in there. And with a little bit of skill and some technique, one can actually count the number of skulls and what you will call them to touch those skulls to give you a pretty good idea of how many puppies there are in there. They can also give you an idea uh, later on in terms of whether or not the embryos are dying or fetuses are dying because the radiographic features uh, can, can help you to some extent. So in a sense, what we normally suggest would be uh, for early pregnancy diagnosis, you do ultrasonography, uh, see that the baby is actually pregnant, and then you suggest to your client, maybe come back uh, about 50 days, so you can have a pretty good count of how many embryos or how many fetuses you have in there. So you, you would know when the process begins, you're not staying up the whole night looking for fetuses that aren't there. It certainly makes a difference with the client. The use of endocrine tests uh, have been a little disappointing uh, simply because 
levels of progesterone, levels of estrogen are really not specific for pregnancy. Uh, levels of prolactin also rise during pregnancy, but they're not specific because there is a condition that we refer to as pseudo-pregnancy in which obviously there is no pregnancy, but prolactin levels may be high. There is one hormone that's pretty diagnostic of, of pregnancy in the bitch, and that's relaxin. It's a protein hormone uh, secreted by the, the fetus, uh, the, the conceptus and the fetal membranes per se, and it's pretty high between day 21 and day 25 after pregnancy, after breeding. So, again, it behooves you to go through the whole process of trying to determine the day of LH surge so you can actually have day zero, so you would know when it's the best time to use uh, relaxin to give you a diagnosis of pregnancy. And in fact, there is a commercial test available from Symbiotics Corporation. There are other ways that one that have been suggested of the diagnosis of pregnancy, and this is what we call the demonstration of accused phase protein. Fibrinogen, C-reactive proteins have been used in limited instances to make a diagnosis of pregnancy. And in fact, there is a commercial test that's available. However, you need to be careful because these are all products of inflammation. And if there's a metritis or pyometra or any other type of systemic disease, these blood levels can be pretty high and could be confusing with respect to the diagnosis of pregnancy. So in a nutshell, uh, I think the plan of attack would be to use ultrasonography where possible. Um, if there's no pregnancy at that time, come back at least 50 days later. If it's 50 days and there is no evidence of mineralization or skulls there, you're pretty sure that there is no pregnancy uh, in, in the bitch. Let's change gears a little bit and talk about the queen. The estrus cycle in the queen can best be described as being seasonal and polyesterous. Simply means that the queen has a breeding season that begins sometime in January or February and terminates usually through November. And it's polyesterous because, as opposed to the bitch, the queen has experiences many, many periods of receptivity within that breeding season. So we say that it's seasonal and it's polyesterous. An important factor that influences the initiation of, of estrous cycles in the bitch, in, in, in the queen, is hours of day length. As day length increases, the breeding season begins to be focused. And in fact, one can use artificial light to keep cats in, in, uh, in heat throughout the year. When may this be important? Um, certain cases of uh, in calories that are breeding um, cats commercially or maybe in, in, in uh, laboratory situations where you're, you're breeding cats for specific experimentation. So one can manipulate the cycle uh, using light. And if you use a 100-watt bulb, in a 4 by 4 meter area, uh, it has been shown to keep cats cycling throughout the year. So again, the cat is seasonal and the cat's polyesterous. The cat has the same phases of the estrous cycle as the bitch does, in addition to one. Let's look at proestrous. And the important thing to remember about the cat in proestrous is it's very short. Remember we talked about in the bitch, it can last as much as 9 to 10 days sometimes as much as 15 days. But in the cat, you hardly ever see proestrous because it's so short, short a time frame. But it does occur with respect to all the hormones that are happening at the same time. So a duration of a half a day, or sometimes two days, or sometimes it's non-existence. One just doesn't see it. This is a time frame in which the queens actually attract the males, but they're not receptive. An important thing to remember about proestrous in the cat is the bleeding that we see and the vulva swelling that we see and the changes in vaginal cytology that we see in the bitch are not consistent or actually do not occur in the cat. So if you were to be presented with a cat that has a bloody discharge, swelling of the vulva, it's obviously an emergency because that, that bleeding has to be coming from somewhere internally and it is not proestrous. So hemorrhagic discharges in the cat uh, usually signal that things are, things are pretty serious. Estrus or receptivity, the period of time in which the queen allows mating. It's an average of about seven days, but it can range from one to 21 days. The situation is such that the cat comes in heat, let's say she comes in heat for one to 21 days. 
The reason she comes in heat is because she's developing follicles in the ovary. And those follicles are actually secreting estrogen. Now, you got to remember that the cat is an induced ovulator, simply meaning that it has to be bred or it has to be stimulated in some way so that those follicles can ovulate. If those follicles don't ovulate, then they go ahead and they go atrotic and they die. And the cat actually comes back in heat within a, 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 about 17 to 19 days. Many times, clients would ask you, the cat's in heat and she has been bred, is she going to go out of heat? Well, in fact, they usually don't. It seems to be that that period of estrus is sort of programmed to the point where she's going to go through that period of estrus that's consistent with her, regardless of whether or not she's been bred. And in fact, the evidence suggests that some cats that have been bred actually have a longer period of receptivity, the suggestion being the stimulation results in GnRH release, more follicular growth on the ovary, and much more estrogen. So even though the cat's been bred, the length of receptivity of estrus does not decrease. We said before that the cat's an induced ovulator. At least the majority of cats are. So if those follicles don't ovulate, they would go ahead and go through a tree here and actually die. Then what happens next is that there has to be many more pulses of GnRH from the, from the hypothalamus to affect the ovary so that more follicles can be developed. So this gives the cat sort of an inter-estrous period, the period in which she is developing follicles to come back into estrus, and this can last sometimes as long as 19 days. So the cat comes in heat, there is no ovulation, the follicles go through a tree here, it takes another 19 days, she comes back in heat again. And we're all too familiar with this scenario of Akron cats that come in heat in February and March. You know, you have this, the howling and the very, all the forms are sort of coming to the house for about two weeks or so, and then they disappear. And you think that the cat's out of heat. In fact, she is. But be assured that she's going to come back in heat within another 19 days, simply because she has another wave of follicles that are growing after this interestrous period. So the interestrous period is really a time of sort of resting for the cat. Sexual inactivity, uh, there's a drop decline in estrogen, estrogen levels are pretty low, the queen doesn't exhibit estrus, she doesn't allow or attract the male. Ovulation. We said before that ovulation is induced in the cat. In a general sense, this is probably correct. However, there's some mounting evidence to suggest that under certain conditions, cats can be spontaneous ovulators. And this is an area that's been heavily researched right now. But I would say the majority of cats can be best described as being induced ovulators. The stimulation from the vagina results in the release of GnRH from the hypothalamus, which then affects the pituitary to release FSH and LH. Follicular uh, growth occurs, and then you have ovulation. You have an LH surge within 15 minutes of mating, and ovulation occurs within 24 to 36 hours post the LH surge. However, it's been shown that less than 50% of cats would ovulate following a single mating. Now, what's the clinical significance of this? Well, it simply means that if you want to get cats pregnant, you need to breed them many, many times. And we know that this occurs in nature, where the tongue would breed the one female maybe every day, three or four times a day, until she actually goes on the heat. And this is necessary because with every mating, you get a release of LH until you get to that point where it's maximal that you would allow ovulation that can occur. So if a cat presents to you with an infertility syndrome, um, been bred but is not pregnant, you need to find out how many times was this cat mated. Because many times, uh, these cats are going to be mated once, and then your client thinks that she's pregnant and everything is okay. But less than 50% of cats actually get pregnant from one mating, simply because there is not enough LH to cause ovulation. Let's switch gears again to look at equine reproduction. We're going to look at the mare specifically, and the areas we're going to consider would be seasonality, uh, reproductive activity, and the estrous cycle. The mare is a long day breeder. It's similar, in fact, to the cat. As day length increases, males begin to get more active in terms of uh, uh, the estrous cycle. So photo period is, is pretty important 
uh, in the mare as much as it is uh, in the cat. So you would predict that reproductive function would be most predictable around the summer solstice. Usually this is June, June 21st, when the days are pretty long. Day length, like we said before, is a major environmental factor. However, health and body condition are also important. It's obvious if the mare is in, is, is in ill health, uh, or if she has a, a very low body condition, she's not going to come in heat even though daylight is there. So one has to look at not only daylight length, but also the health and the body condition of the mare. The changes in day length are recognized by the retina. And these signals are then transmitted by the optic nerve to the pineal gland. The pineal gland actually secretes melatonin. And as day length begins to decrease, you have an increase in melatonin. So the presence of melatonin is actually responsible for mares going out of heat. And the important thing about melatonin is that melatonin inhibits the release of GnRH. So anything that would inhibit the release of GnRH is obviously going to prevent cyclicity simply because ovarian activity is not going to occur. So why is photo period important? Um, it's simply because most breed registries, like you know, uh, foals are one year of age on the 1st of January of any year. So what does that do, considering the, the gestation length in the mare, it means that these mares have to be bred at the time when fertility is not the best. Because to have a 12-month uh, gestation means you have to be bred 12 months period. And mares that are bred in June, which is maximum fertility, usually would have the foal the following June, and that foal would actually be up a year of age, although in reality it's almost, it's really six months of age. So seasonality um, puts a little bit of pressure uh, on fertility in the mare simply because we have to manipulate the cycle so much uh, in terms of providing artificial light and breeding at, the wrong, at, at really the wrong time and the use of all these hormones um, really presents a problem to the practitioner to have maximum fertility uh, in, in the mare. Let's look at reproductive activity and basically there are four phases. We think of winter and estrus. And this is a period of reproductive quiescence. Uh, it occurs around the shortest day of the year, uh, December 21st. And there's little ovarian activity. It's a very flaccid uterus. If one were to use a uh, vaginoscopy to observe the uterus, um, or palpation to observe the uterus, one would see that there basically is no activity uh, on the ovary or in the uterus or in the cervix. And reproductive behavior is pretty unpredictable. Uh, depending on where you are, uh, in terms of the hemispheres, you may have uh, some estrus activity, although there is no fertility to this estrus. The vernal transition, uh, where you have receptivity, but these follicles don't ovulate. And it tends to occur when you get around March 21st, when the days are actually beginning to increase in length. So you have very long erratic cycles, a large non ovulatory follicles, and prolonged periods of estrous behavior. And this is what we call the, the so-called transition period, um, in which the mare is really out of sync, you know. Um, daylight is telling her that she should be coming in heat, but the ovaries and the pituitary uh, aren't responding to the GnRH like it should. So things are a little uh, out of sync, and you have long uh, erratic cycles and prolonged periods of estrous behavior. Publicary receptivity, uh, the best time actually to breed, to breed the mare. Uh, peak of fertility is at the summer solstice, which is June uh, 21st. Uh, during this time frame, most mares are going to exhibit regular estrus cycles every 18 to 21 days. An interesting thing is, as day length increases, the duration of estrus becomes shorter. And that presents some problems, especially um, in terms of trying to predict the best time to breed this, the mare in terms of receptivity. So keep this in mind, and also the fact that many, many mares are being bred way out of the time when it's maximum fertility. Then you get into the autumn, which actually coincides with the, with the uh, autumnal equinox, September 21. The length of day and the length of night are pretty much equal. So she's going back, this is another transition, 
which is actually going all ahead. The signal that the pineal gland begins to decrease, uh, melatonin begins to increase, and the male is actually going into anestrus. And here again, you're going to have some variation in terms of uh, the endocrine response, clinical response that you see, and also estrus behavior. So males during the autumnal transition uh, develop erratic estrus behavior, and ovulation is actually unpredictable. In fact, many of those follicles that are formed as a result of, of those estrus cycles don't ovulate. Uh, they just go ahead and undergo a tree here, and traditionally we call them the autumn follicles. <coughs> and they can be pretty big, although many times they don't ovulate. <coughs> So let's look at the estrous cycle specifically now uh, in terms of when they do, when, when they do occur and uh, what are some of the characteristics of the estrous cycle. Puberty in, in the, in the mare, uh, 12 to 24 months of age. The mare is also seasonally polyesterous, simply meaning she has a lot of estrous cycles, a lot of periods of receptivity of estrous within the breeding season. However, she's not like the cat where she has an endoestrous. She goes from one estrus to the next, to the next, uh, until she actually goes out of heat. <coughs> and the cycle usually is about 18 to 21 days. And we tend to break the estrus cycle in, into basically uh, two components. There's the follicular phase, or the phase of, of follicular growth, high estrogen secretion, and obviously high estrus response. And then there's the phase that we call the luteal phase, or diestrus, which is primarily the phase of the corpus luteum, or very high levels of progesterone. The follicular phase is, is characterized by the development of follicles and estrogen secretion. Uh, in the mare, we have two follicular waves. In fact, we can have follicles present during estrus and follicles present during diestrus. However, most of the follicles that are present during diestrus, which is high levels of, of progesterone at that time, don't ovulate. But they can occur. And we talk about uh, diestral ovulations, especially in terms of uh, the end result being twinning, because many of these follicles actually have a, a very fertile oocyte. So you can actually have a follicle that ovulates under the influence of progesterone in diestrus, that if the mare's bred at that time, if she shows estrus, she can actually get pregnant. So you have a scenario where she came, to, she came in heat, uh, at estrus, you bred her, and you think everything is okay, and she suddenly comes back in heat uh, 10 to 12 days later, you go ahead and you breed her, and you end up with twins. So be really careful, because a certain percentage of follicles that develop during the diestral phase can actually ovulate and, and have a pregnancy. During estrus, we have a dominant follicle, uh, which is recruited, it's selected, and, and it ovulates. In addition, even at the time of estrus, you can have more than one follicle ovulating. So in addition to the diastral follicle that might ovulate, you may have a double ovulation at the time she's estrus. And, and as you know, this predisposes to twinning, which is a major, major problem and a cause of infertility uh, in the mare. And there are many ways to handle twinning, which time doesn't permit that we can discuss right now. Uh, but really, um, twins in the mare are, are basically a major problem. Although it's been shown that twinning in the mare is actually controlled primarily by a mechanism within the mare's uterus per se. So, although we see a fair percentage of twins, uh, there are many more twins that do occur that the mare sort of, sort of takes care of, of naturally by some mechanism within the uterus that destroys uh, the one, the one uh, embryo. When the mare is in heat, it's usually as a result of estrogen secreted by this dominant follicle, and the mare shows signs of heat, which we know as, as uh, receptivity. Um, she passively urinates, she raises her tail, and she winks the clitoris. And these are all sort of classic signs of estrus uh, in, in the, in the mare. Follicular size, in terms of, uh, follicle size in, in the mare, they get pretty big. You know, if you see, uh, it's not uncommon to have mares with follicles of 50 or 60 or 70 millimeters. And it seems to me that each mare has as is consistent with respect to the size of, of the follicle. It's also consistent within each cycle. Ovulation in the mare is spontaneous, and it usually occurs 24 hours before the mare goes out of heat. Another interesting point in the mare is that 
The follicle ovulates through a specific area in the ovary that we call the ovulation fossil. And this only happens in the mare. In the rest of the species, follicles can ovulate at any point in the ovary. But in the mare, it seems to be that it ovulates through the ovulation fossil. And what this does is it presents a situation in which the corporal luteum are so deeply embedded within the ovary of the mare that they cannot be felt on rectal palpation. So whereas we can feel the corporal luteum uh, in the cow uh, by rectal palpation, um, you cannot feel the corpus luteum uh, in the mare simply because it's deeply embedded within the ovary as a result of ovulation through the ovulation process. And all the follicles that are there, that's estrus, that don't ovulate, that go through the, the atresia, um, and they die as a result of uh, a lack of GnRH release. Following ovulation, you have what we call the luteal phase. So the luteal phase begins with the formation of the corpus luteum. Within 24 to 48 hours post-ovulation, which is actually uh, a very hemorrhagic sort of a circumstance in, in the mare, there's a major blood clot where that follicle ovulated. And there's invasion of granulosa cells and luteal cells beginning to form a corpus luteum. The structure at this time is called a corpus hemorrhagicum, simply meaning a body of blood. And you have a lot of bleeding. In fact, there are instances in some, in, in some cases where the reports that mares actually can get pretty sick following ovulation simply because they've lost a lot of blood. Now, these are the extremes, but it's just to, to point out the fact that there is a lot of hemorrhage in terms of ovulation uh, in, in the mare. The corpus hemorrhagicum uh, would last for about 24 to 48 hours, and then further release of LH from the anterior pituitary uh, luteinizes these uh, cells within that corpus hemorrhagicum, and you get the formation of a corpus luteum. So when you get to day five or day six, you have what we call a mature corpus luteum as, com as compared to corpus hemorrhagicum within the first 24 to 48 hours. And the purpose of the corpus luteum is to secrete pedestrian. And we know that progesterone is necessary for maintaining pregnancy in the mare, um, at least from the ovary within the first 180 days or so. So that's the reason that you have progesterone. The obvious lifespan in the, the corpus luteum in a normal non-pregnant mare is about 14 to 15 days. If pregnancy does not ensue as a result of that particular mating, then the corpus luteum, or the corpus lutea, have to be destroyed. And there's a mechanism that's built into the, to the mare that we call luteolysis, which destroys the CL. So let's assume that the mare is not pregnant. By 14 to 15 days post-ovulation, prostaglandin F2-alpha is released from the uterus and destroys the corpus luteum. The interesting thing about prostaglandin release in the mare is that it's released from the uterus, it goes systemically, and then comes back to the corpus luteum via the systemic circulation to destroy the CL. And I point this out because in the cow, it's a local mechanism. Directly, prostaglandins come directly from the uterus to the ovary in the cow. This doesn't happen in the mare. It has to be systemic. So if the mare is not pregnant, you get progression in the corpus luteum, Cyclicity begins again, and then the mare has an opportunity to get pregnant, provided she is within that breeding season. If it's close to September, October, most likely she's going to go in with the transition and ultimately end up in an estrus, only to be cycled again, come back the following year in February. So this sort of takes care of uh, the topics we had to discuss today. Um, so in retrospect, we've talked a little bit about uh, um, the bitch and the queen and also uh, in, in the mare with respect to some of the uniqueness of the, of the estrus cycle uh, within the bitch. Uh, thank you very much, and I wish you good luck.